All right, on today's Winning Cures Everything, we welcome in Fantasy Sports Hall of Famer Rick Wolf. Now, let me riff for just a minute about his credentials. He has been a leader in fantasy sports since the mid-90s. He's been a co-host on Colton and the Wolfman on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio since 2012. He runs FantasyAlarm.com and is currently the Senior Vice President of B2B US and Fantasy Sports of Spotlight Sports Group. Also, you can follow him on Twitter at rickwolf one Rick, I really appreciate you carving out some time for the show. Yeah, and, and well, well done with uh, with the bio uh, moments there. I, uh, I, uh, you know, I always wonder how how those things happen to me. So, uh, <laughs> had a long story career. I was ten years an IBM programmer before founding, um, helping to find, found uh, Sportsline USA, which became CBSSports.com. It's, I and do want to get into a lot of that actually. Yeah, a whole lot. And of then that. after that, I founded Rotor World. So, like, just in in places where. You know, Roto World already existed, and it was it was inside of a league manager. And I said, why don't we make that the destination site? You know, it's just like asking, I guess, asking smart people the right questions. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's how most stuff. people uh, continue into a career, right? Is making sure, or not making sure, but asking, you know, why don't we do it a certain way? Just the the curious minds yeah. that maybe have something that's right in front of other people's noses. That uh, that you can profit off of, or just give something to the consumers that they they really want, but don't necessarily know that they want it yet. Right, right, exactly. And asking the right questions to understand what they do want too. Finding people's finding people's pain points or their difficulties is what made all of sports tools and now even sports betting tools, um, you know, becoming what they are. People are like, hey, how do I find an overlay on this? Oh, well, somebody's going to invent a tool now that does that, right? So the same thing with fantasy was, you know, how do I run my league and not have to write down the numbers from the USA Today every Wednesday and Thursday in order to get AFC and then NFC? Um, so, you know, we built built programs that did it automatically for you. It's very, very easy nowadays to be able to get that information. Uh, where, Like you said, you used to have to just write it all down, which is what I used to do. And, and now what I do is put them into Google Sheets uh, which is not the most efficient way to do it. There are other ways to go about this stuff. Uh, so today, like, I don't want to dive too much into current fantasy suggestions or advice. I do want to introduce you to our audience. So let's go ahead and start here. You are a current and founding board member of the FSTA. That's the uh, Fantasy Sports Trade Association. Can you tell the listeners what that is and, and how it was yeah. started? Yeah, it, it, it has recently, uh, two years ago, been rebranded the Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association um, as many of our members were sports betting and uh, and video game oriented. So um, we want to make sure that we cover everything. But uh, it started in the late 90s, um, honestly, because there was a strong confusion between sports betting and fantasy. You know, fantasy being a game of skill and monitored by different laws than sports betting was. Um, and at the time, there were some pretty onerous things going on surrounding the government trying to slow down, especially offshore betting or illegal betting in the United States. So, and we honestly thought, up, oh, passport would be repealed a couple years from now, and sports betting is going to be legal. And, and that was in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, so we're like, by two thousand, it's going to be legal. And honestly, we had the two-year rule like until two thousand and two thousand eighteen when it finally finally flipped. But we really thought like sports betting was just going to, you know pop uh, pop pop legal so um we 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 formed in order to protect the players the people who were playing fantasy so that they wouldn't be considered gambling and regulations wouldn't be put on your home league um and uh that was in 1998 a handful of people got together at a conference and in tampa florida and decided you know it's time to get it started i was running cbssports.com at that time um and i was not one of the people who thought that we should start this, but they said, let's grab some other influential people and make them founding board members. So there were five people who started it and there were five founding board members and the 10 of us sort of, sort of started the trade association to try and protect players from, from, uh, from gambling laws. That's a, you, it, it does bring up uh, in my mind, all the different things that went on with Rick Neuheisel, who was the, I think the Washington head coach at the time yeah. who entered a NCAA tournament bracket and ended up losing his job over it because it was considered gambling, which it wasn't on the sport that he gambled on, et cetera. But now you don't really see that as much. It's much more uh, fantasy sports. It's much more, you know, anybody can can play so long as it is not considered, I guess, gambling at that point. So it's it's a lot different now than I think it was initially back in the 90s. You, you mentioned the 90s. Uh, you were a programmer at IBM. It, it led to... Uh, I guess you helped develop the first ever fantasy game online with Prodigy. 
Now, not yeah, long yeah, after that. Was, uh, yeah, go ahead. Let's start on that one. Uh, the the yeah, first I mean, fantasy game on Prodigy. None of these things that I talk about I did by myself. I mean, uh, <laughs> every idea has 10 fathers and 100 people to execute it. Oh, of course. Um, so, but there was a concept from John Butterworth called uh, Baseball Manager. It was a simulation game, so it wasn't exactly a fantasy game, but pretty close. You know, you put your lineup in, and then based on, on real performances, but they came from a stat pool. They didn't come from last night's performance. They came from random random performances that those athletes had had previously in that season. So every season started middle of May. So you had six weeks of performances bucketed. So you made sure that you had performances that were against the proper handed pitcher. So Cal Ripken only batting against Randy Johnson in your league, he would get a left-handed performance from the stat pool in order to be able gotcha. to determine. So it was very, it was a very sophisticated concept concept. And uh, you know, we developed it for the, the prodigy network. Um, the, it was the first online network before the internet. And honestly, if you had more time, I'd tell you why it would have been the internet until IBM screwed up. Um, but uh, it would have it would have been the internet. Um, it's, but Prodigy I, was the first thing. Let me interrupt you. Prodigy was the first internet that I had at the house. It basically, it was dial up, and the only thing that we ever got on it at that point was message boards. So anytime we needed any kind of information regarding sports, and I was young, young, young at the time, uh, but my father had it. And we had one computer in the house. We would hop on Prodigy, and we would go to these message boards to try and get information on college football teams back then. And that was wow. the only way you could really get anything other than the newspaper. And because we lived four hours away, he was a huge uh, Alabama fan, which yeah. our entire family is. But we lived you know, over four hours away at the time from Tuscaloosa. So you could not get information. And exactly. those message boards were, were lifesavers. So this was uh, very... It, it, brand new and, and incredible to a young mind yeah. back then that we could actually do something like that. <laughs> and so I, I was on the communications team, so I was responsible for writing all the communications back to these giant mainframes from <laughs> from staging computers that then were, there were 400 of them around the country that then they cached, they cached all the information from people local like you who, were di who would dial into your closest one, and then you would download the information from there. So I was the communications specialist who wrote the bulletin board software, helped to write the... Um, the email software. We wrote the chat software, even though they told us not to. They said, "No, no, you don't. We don't. We don't. We don't want chat." So we at IBM, you know, they gave you they gave you five months to do the forty five minute project that you had. Oh yes. So for the other for the other four and a half months, we worked on our own projects. So we wrote we wrote the chat system. Actually, jokingly calling it Rocky and Boinkle because it was client and server um, <laughs> at the time. So for those of you in the audience who are older, uh, you'll you'll get that one. Uh, but. That, but, that, uh, yeah. Not not long after uh, Prodigy and everything else, you were a key person in helping legitimize fantasy sports in the mainstream. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong. You kind of helped establish relationships. Was it between Commissioner.com and the MLB and the NFL? Can, can you kind of walk me through that yeah. story? Yeah. Well. Um, so and and I'm not the only. I'm the, again. I'm not the only one. Always right. So, but uh, but you know, you were talking about the college the college situation, the legalization. Uh, and that case, that case was really not about um, the bracket or betting on the bracket. It was about the 501 status of the college institutions. Yeah. They were considered nonprofit organizations. And because of that, um, that, that put them in a gray area where they could lose their funding from the government if the government thought that they were doing anything nefarious. So it didn't even have to be gambling. It could be anything, right? Yeah. Um, so that same situation hit us at, at CBS because um, we owned a property called Vegas Insider, which started by Mark Mariani and Dan Murphy and, you know, my group of programmers. And, uh, and you know, we, we built that for Sportsline. And, and CBS said, the NCAA wants us to shut that down. You got to get, we got to get rid of that. We got to divest of that. So, and that was, that was in uh, 97 or about 97. And then CBS also said, well, you know, you got to get rid of this fantasy thing, right? So, and we, had, we hadn't completely started it. So the, the aforementioned Mark Mariani, Ross Levinson, myself, and a couple of others got in a room and tried to figure out what we were going to do with that. So we convinced CBS that it was that it was okay to, to do, and then we decided we were going to try and consolidate the fantasy industry under the CBS sports line, sports brand. So they gave me a bunch of money to go out and find the right companies. What's the best way to find the companies? Start a trade organization. <laughs> so they had just started that trade organization and in 98, and so we went out to try and, and buy whatever we could. So one of the things that was available was the NFL and the MLB didn't believe that fantasy was worth anything. So we went to them and they said, no, it's honestly, 
one of the NFL executives said it was, it, it was for freaks and geeks. And I raised my hand and I said, I'm both. Um, <laughs> like I'm that so, guy. <laughs> yeah. And then, so we said, well, why don't we just do it under your brand? We'll, we'll white label the whole thing and uh, we'll keep all the revenue, but we, we'll give you $10 million for three years. So in 1997, we gave them $10 million each for three years. And we ran the official fantasy games for the NFL and for MLB making close to 30 million in those oh, yeah. three years. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so because of that, they then took it back and then built their own. And now they both have thriving fantasy communities. Oh, of course, um, of course. Well, I mean, it, it completely reestablished. Uh, it made them cool. It made them cool at that point because you no longer had to worry just about your own team, uh, whether it's yeah. the Mets or whoever. If that team is out of it, you've still got something going on. There is still something to pay attention to around the league. So it's it obviously made them yep. uh, a lot more money and it made them more interesting as they grew along. So uh, so I, I could say that you and your counterparts definitely helped grow their brands, and they had no idea what they were sitting on at the time. <laughs> it just yeah, blows that, my mind. And the leaders were, you know, Mark Mariani and Ross Levinson, who I mentioned, then Peter Pizaris and Michael Gersh, who um, owned Commissioner.com, and they did the software in order to be able to bring that. And then, you know, the, the intense bravery of Michael Levy to, to just give us $20 million to, to yeah. spend, um, you know, pre-public we weren't public yet we didn't go public until october of 97 so you know we had a war chest from ibm us west and kleiner perkins and and uh shack michael jordan tiger woods um all uh, img uh, netscape sun microsystems everybody was putting money into us and so he just said it's okay to spend 20 million dollars and go consolidate the industry by by putting our software up on on uh on the, the leaks and now it, it certainly helped things uh, i your story is so interesting. I am so curious about all of this. Uh, back in the early 2000s, you were working with All Star Stats. Uh, NBC Universal yeah. ended up purchasing them. You became the director of business development for NBC. I hope I said that name right. Uh, yeah. But for NBC Sports Digital. Now, how did that go down? What was that like? Like, had you done anything like uh, being a director of business development for a digital sports company uh, up until that point? Yeah, yeah. Um when uh, when I was with Sportsline, I moved over to the business side uh, in the end end of ninety nine in uh, ninety nine, and then when I was with All Star Stats, when I started with them in two thousand one, I was their SVP of strategic partnerships. So I was already running business development, doing partnerships for for them, and then also for the industry. You know, I was representing the industry in in certain rooms. I was the chairman at that time from two thousand two to two thousand six of the F, then FSTA um, as we changed to the trade association. So, gotcha. yeah, you know, I had some good experience there and certainly understood the digital side. One of the complicated things about being a business guy is understanding technology. So being somebody who has a computer science degree and, and has you know, been in the trenches before can help understand when inflated time timelines come from tech departments or, you know, or when unrealistic time timelines come from potential investments. So gotcha. um, just something good to know about technology if you're if you're in the uh, in the C-suite. Now, that definitely makes sense. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, the Fantasy Sports Network that you currently run? Uh, I'm, I'm curious about all of the different levels uh, that you, you've got the website, you've got the radio show, you've got uh, all these other different uh, branches, I guess you could say. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, and, and the most important branch we probably haven't talked about yet, and that's the Spotlight Sports Group, right? That's, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm the SVP of, of business of partnerships for that. And that in, that entails so much more than what you know Fantasy Alarm did uh, before, because now they bring a girth of content creators, a girth of technology, um, and the most important thing is their understanding of SEO and and social media marketing in order to help people do sports affiliation, which is incredibly lucrative right now and exploding in the sports betting landscape. So we're helping lots of different partners with that. We, you know, we announced a partnership with Advanced Local where we're helping their Syracuse.com property and their, their um, Staten Island SILive.com uh, property and the MichiganLive.com property, MLive. Um, let's make sure that we can work together in order to you know, drive affiliation and, and create a universe where people belong, create sports experiences where people belong. Um, cause that's what I've done my whole career since the very beginning. You were talking about the bulletin boards. Yes. We created an air, we created different verticals in bulletin boards where you felt like you belonged. Right. Yeah. When you went into yeah. the movies vertical, if you're a movies fan, you had people to talk to. 
And so that's what we're creating here at the at, at, at SSG, at Spotlight Sports Group, is those kind of places, those experiences where you, where you belong. Everything from helping with NBC Sports Edge, um, working with the Fade the Noise Network. Uh, actually, they're called FTN Network now. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course, the advanced local partner, like I talked, and, and hopefully some other major brands coming down the pike soon. Uh, most certainly. Now, I play season-long NFL fantasy almost every season. Uh, now, I didn't this past season. That was partly because 2020 bit me so badly with some of the guys that I had missing games due to COVID or, or games being moved, et cetera. What would be your preference? Uh, do you still play, uh, you know, do you do daily fantasy or season long? Is it more fun yeah. to roll with both? What, uh, what do you look at the industry like now? I mean, I, I play them all because I find having a rooting interest is really a lot of fun. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you can do that for a small amount of money. And the tools at fantasyalarm.com. Uh, and dfsalarm.com can help you figure out um, how to do those things in a way that that I can, you know, when I play and I win, that's just more money to play with. Oh right? yes, for me, that, for me, it's <laughs> it's all about you know playing more. And, and sports betting is the same thing. You know, last night uh, for the uh, for the NCAA a championship game, you know, I was live I was live betting on the Kansas line all all second half. <laughs> you know, picked it up at halftime and 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 rode it all the way out. So, um, you know, to me, I think that's really fun when you're right. When you're wrong, it's, I think it's still just as much fun. Oh yeah, so I agree. It makes the games it makes the games more fun to watch. That's what we said in 1998, and it's still true now for both sports betting and for fantasy. So I I play five or six different DFS sports, and uh, and I play heavy in baseball and football, including in the expert leagues like the League of Alternative Baseball Reality and Tab Wars. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. My wife and I uh, we have started. To, obviously, I've been gambling for. Quite some time, we have found uh, this, I forget the product exactly, it's Moneyline Dice, and basically uh. you, you just roll, and she has a lot of fun with this. So we, uh, we enjoyed that last evening quite a bit. Um, it didn't win, but <laughs> it was still <laughs> nice to have a rooting interest. Uh, for the first time fantasy sports player, what would be your advice to, uh, to help them be successful early? I would say don't be afraid and play for fun. So try to find like-minded people, people of similar... Uh, you know, if you're if you're someone who just likes the New York Giants and just like, you know, follows the NFC East and you know isn't a big uh, you know isn't as big into every single player, then find other people who are like that to play with. Um, the more the more people the more you're in a place where you belong, um, the better you'll the more fun you'll have. No, that and, does you know, that does make sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just and to be so, around people that have uh, it's similar interests, right? Yeah, and there's really no downside to playing, you know, in a in a in a starting in a free league on Yahoo or, or on ESPN, um, because generally those a lot of people play many many leagues, and so maybe there'll be three or four out of four or five out of twelve people playing ha- playing hard, and then it gives you just a chance to sort of get a feel for it. Um, but I suggest you just get a small group of of friends together. I start everybody in my family in the family league, right? So we we have a ten team league. And we sort of rotate first timers from around my extended family to come in and play. And then everybody feels like they have fun and it's all family based. So I (laughs) I suggest you start slow. That's the easy way. I think Uh, my, my father is 63 years old and played fantasy this last year with a a few guys from work and did it for the first time. And he is absolutely hooked. He used to not give a rip about the NFL and and now he was watching every Sunday. He was watching yeah. every game, trying to see what his guys were going to do. And uh, I introduced him to the Red Zone channel, et cetera, so that he could see the scoring plays and whatnot as they were happening. It blew my mind. He had no interest in it before he started playing fantasy, and now he wants to get a league together for uh, the rest of our family this year. And, of course, I said, all right, I, I might jump back in be- <laughs> again because of how badly I was bit in 2020. I didn't play it this last year. But uh, but season long with the family, yeah, it gives you some uh, some rivalries a little bit, yeah. something interesting, some good trash talking. <laughs> you got good that right. Talking. Something something that you can fight over at Thanksgiving, <laughs> like we don't have enough For already. Sure. <laughs> now let's For uh, sure. let's give the people some current stuff before we get out of here. Opening day for baseball is almost here. Uh, there were yeah. a ton of free agency moves this year, et cetera. Do you have any sleepers for people to watch as they are playing fantasy in MLB this year? Well, it depends on how deep a sleeper you want, right? And so, and in general, the sleepers don't come from the, the from the big free agents who sign other places because sixty eight percent of those have a downtrodden April. It's hard to get used to a new place. Oh yes. And so, that generally, unless your name is J D Martinez, 
you know, when you go to a new home, you struggle uh, when you first get there. So, you know, I would expect your Corey Seegers and your and your Marcus Simeons and your Javier Baez, guys like that, to to have um, to have a, a tough first couple of weeks at least. And you know, when you take a couple of weeks away and it's one twelfth of the season, you know, that can really affect your season long numbers. So I stay away from those guys. And uh, you know, generally speaking, if you're if you're a first time player in baseball or you're you're not a, a high end player, age matters a real lot. Guys who have between eight hundred and a thousand at bats in the major leagues before they turn twenty five generally will have that their biggest year in that year. So in their in their twenty fifth or twenty six year old season. So if you look back at the last six years of home run leaders, you'll see that there are a larger percentage of twenty five and twenty six year old players on each year's list. So it's just the year that it, that that players explode from a power standpoint. Tends to make so the that's most something sense. to look for. So and, so could we expect more from uh, from maybe Pete Alonso this year uh, because yes, he's had a couple of big ex- years. Uh, you, he's had a couple of big years, and he has he has well more than a thousand under his belt. So guys like him and Tatis and and Acuna, who started younger, um, their their growth spot already hit. It's when they hit that thousand at bats, and they're coming into their twenty into their twenty five or twenty six year old season where you see most guys. So I would say he's probably he's probably already already hit. Um, but you know you saw it last year with Matt Olson. Matt Olson turned twenty five last yep. year. <laughs> right, you know, you just see these guys just pop in their twenty in their twenty five. Hey, season. you brought up then, uh, you brought up Acuna. Let me interrupt you really quick. Uh, does yeah. coming off of an injury does that ever really play into the way that you would play it? Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't know if I should get into it or not, um, but <laughs> we have we have what we call the SMART system. It's okay. a it's an acronym. It's it stands for scarcity management, uh, ACE, relief and team. Okay, um, for how you draft your team because. You know, like I said, I'm running the business side of a lot of things now, so I have to cut the player pool. I cut the the 800 per player pool down to about 110 gotcha. players, and those are the only 110 I'll draft. And I do that based on a certain set of rules. I call them the rules of engagement. Okay. And so one of them is injured players tend to get injured again. So I try. I just eliminate all players who were injured last year. That's it. <laughs> Bye. They're all gone. <laughs> No, seriously, it's very. It's it very makes simple. sense. It does right. make sense. Players, players who who sign a big contract in a new, um, in a new home, I cut I cut their value down by twenty percent. That means I'm probably not owning them. But if I do get one of them at that twenty percent discount, then great, I'm happy to do that, um, for the exact reason that we just talked about, right? They're, yeah. they have, they're going to struggle when they get started. For pitchers, it's you want pitchers who throw gas, guys who throw hard. You know, and I'm not talking about you know throwing have to throw 100, but I'm talking about don't be taking pitchers who whose fastball is 89 or 88. You want 93 or above, and um, and that that means that they're more predictable, more projectable. So then you can get more assurance with your players. So I cut out everybody who has a velo below 93 on their fastball won't be on my team. And so we have these rules of engagement. You can get them at fantasyalarm.com/smart if you want to take a look. Of course. Um, and uh, and and they're just just the things that you need to do in order to make sure that you can cut that pool down enough so you can make it so you make it manageable for you to be able to draft. I absolutely love it, Rick. Uh, if you would go ahead, tell everybody again where all they can find you. What is the best way to be able to get your content? Okay, well, uh, fantasyalarm.com slash smart is one way. Fantasyalarm.com, of course, we're there, and uh, you can go to spotlightsportsgroup.com if you're a business owner and you want us to help you with your business, whether it's affiliation or games or tools. Um, they're all self-service, so they, they're, they're software as a service. We give them to you, and you use them, create your own tools. Maybe you'll want them. And, uh, and to also you know, make your own games. So I think that's a, that's a very good place to find. And then, of course, on SiriusXM on Tuesday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern, Colton and the Wolfman. I am not Colton, so uh, I will be howling, uh, howling on Tuesday nights. Uh, if you if you want to join on uh, Sirius XM Fantasy Sports. Absolutely. Of course, on Twitter as well, at RickWolf1. How often are you on Twitter? I'm on Twitter enough to um, post charts and stuff, about <laughs> mostly about baseball. Um, and I respond to anybody who, who, who tweets at me. But I'm just not all that popular with my 5,000 uh, five <laughs> uh, or so folks. So. It makes sense. It makes sense. Well, look, we appreciate you joining the show. We hope to have you back over the summer heading into football season once we get ready for fantasy NFL and uh, and maybe some fantasy college football. Uh, I'm, I'm supposing that you guys cover that one as well? 
Uh, yes, we do. Of course, Wonderful. we cover 13 sports at Fantasy Alarms. Oh, my goodness. I love it. I love yeah. it. Well, we certainly appreciate you joining us. All right. Thanks, my friend. Of course. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.